everybody. Here we come to the Count of Monte Cristo, chapter 46. Madame de saint Milan. Valentine found her grandmother in bed, silent caresses, heart-rending sobs, broken sighs, and burning tears were the sole recountable details of the distressing interview, at which Madame de Villefort was present, leaning on her husband's arm, and manifesting, outwardly at least, great sympathy for the poor widow. After a few moments, she whispered to her husband, I think it would be better for me to retire, for the sight of me still appears to distress your mother-in-law. Madame de saint Marin heard her and whispered to Valentine, Yes, yes, let her go, but do you stay with me. Madame de Villefort went out, and Valentine remained alone with her grandmother, for the Procro du Roy, dismayed at the sudden death, had followed his wife. At last, worn out with grief, Madame de saint Marin succumbed to her fatigue and fell into a feverish sleep. Valentine placed a small table within her reach and on it a decanter of orangeade, her usual beverage, and leaving her beside, went to see old Nautier. She went up to the old man and kissed him. He looked at her with such tenderness that she again burst into tears. Yes, yes, I understand, she said. You wish to convey to me that I still have a good grandfather, do you not? He intimated that such was his meaning. Happily, I have, returned Valentine. Otherwise, what would become of me? It was one o'clock in the morning. Broy, who wished to go to bed himself, remarked that after such a distressing evening, everyone had need of rest. Monsieur Nautier would have liked to say all that, say that all the repose he needed was to be found in his granddaughter's presence, but he bade her good night, for grief and fatigue had made her look quite ill. When Valentine went to see her grandmother the next day, she found her still in bed. The fever had not abated. On the contrary, the old Marquise's eyes were lit up with a dull fire, and she was prone to great nervous irritability. Oh, Grandmama, are you feeling worse? exclaimed Valentine on perceiving all these symptoms. No, child, but I was impatiently waiting for you to fetch your father to me. My father? inquired Valentine uneasily. Yes, I wish to speak to him. Valentine did not dare oppose her grandmother's wish, and an instant later Villefort entered. You wrote me, monsieur, concerning this child's marriage, said Madame de saint Moran, coming straight to the point as though afraid she did not had not much time left. Yes, madame, replied Villefort, the matter has been settled has already been settled. Is not the name of your future son in law, monsieur Franz de Epinay? Yes, madame. Is he the son of General de Epinay, who belonged to our party and was assassinated a few days before the usurper returned from Elba? The very same. Is he not opposed to this alliance with the daughter of a Jacobin? Our civil dissensions are now happily dispelled, said Villefort. Monsieur de Epinay was little more than a child when his father died. He hardly knows Monsieur Nautier and will greet him, if not with pleasure, at least with unconcern. It is a is it a desirable match? In every respect, he has one of the most gentleman young, gentlemanly young men I know. Valentine remained silent throughout this conversation. Then, monsieur, you must hasten on the marriage, for I have not much longer to live, said Madame de saint Moran after a few seconds' reflection. You, madame? You, grandma? cried Monsieur de Villefort and Valentine simultaneously. I know what I am saying, returned the Marquise. You must hasten on the arrangement so that the poor motherless child may at least have a grandmother to bless her marriage. I am all that is left to her of dear René, whom you appeared so soon to have forgotten. But grandmamma, consider decorum, a recent mourning. Would you have me begin my married life under such sad auspices? Nay, I tell you, I am going to die, and before dying I wish to see her husband. I wish to bid him make my child happy, to read in his eyes whether he intends to obey me. In short, I must know him, continued the grandmother with a terrifying expression in her eyes, so that I may arise from the depths of my grave to seek him out if he is not all he should be. Madame, you must dispel such feverish ideas that are almost akin to madness, said Villefort. Once the dead laid, are laid in their graves, they remain there, never to rise again. And I tell you, monsieur, it is not as you think. Last night my sleep was sorely troubled. It seemed as though my soul were already hovering over my body, my eyes which I tried to open closed against my will. And what will appear impossible, above all to you, monsieur, with my eyes shut, I saw you yonder, in yonder dark corner, where there is a door leading to Madame de Villefort's dressing room. I tell you, I saw a white figure enter noiselessly. Valentine screamed. It was the fever acting on you, madame, said Villefort. Doubt my word if it pleases you, but I am sure of what I say. I saw a figure, and as if God feared I should discredit the testimony of my senses, I heard my tumbler move. 
the same one that is now on the table. But it was a dream, Grandmama. So far was it from being a dream that I stretched out my hand toward the bell, but as I did so, the shadow disappeared and my maid entered with a light. Phantoms are visible only to those who are intended to see them. It was my husband's spirit. If my husband's spirit can come to me, why should not mine appear to guard my granddaughter? It seems to me there is an even stronger tie between us. Madame, do not give way to such gloomy thoughts, said Villefort, deeply affected in spite of himself. You will live long with us, happy, loved, and honored, and we will help you to forget. Never, 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 said the Marquise. When does Monsieur de Epinay return? We expect him at any moment. It is well. As soon as he arrives, let me know. We must lose no time. Then I also wish to see a notary that I may be assured that all our property reverts to Valentine. Oh, my grandmother, murmured Valentine, pressing her lips to her grandmother's burning brow. Do you wish to kill me? Oh, how feverish you are. Is it, it is a doctor whom you must send for, not a notary. A doctor, she said, shrugging her shoulders. I am not ill. I am thirsty. Nothing more. What are you drinking, Grandmama? The same as usual, my dear Orangeade. Give me my glass, Valentine. Valentine poured the orangeade into a glass and gave it to her grandmother, though not without a feeling of dread, for it was the same glass she declared the shadow had touched. The Marquise drained the glass at a single draught, and then, turning onto her pillow, repeated, The notary! The notary! Monsieur de Villefort left the room, and Valentine seated herself at her grandmother's bedside. Two hours passed thus, during which Madame de saint Moran was in restless, feverish sleep. At last the notary arrived. He was announced in a very slow, low voice. Nevertheless, Madame de saint Moran heard and raised herself on her pillows. Go, Valentine, go, she said, and leave me alone with this gentleman. Valentine kissed her grandmother and left the room with her handkerchief to her eyes. At the door, she met the valet, who told her the doctor was waiting in the salon. She instantly went down. Oh, dear Monsieur de Avenay, we have been waiting for you with such impatience. It was ear ill, dear child, said he, not your father or Madame de Villefort. It is my grandmother who needs your services. You know the calamity that has befallen us. I know nothing, said Monsieur de Avenay. Alas, said Valentine, choking back her tears. My grandfather is dead. Monsieur de saint Maran. yes, suddenly, from an apoplectic stroke. An apoplectic stroke, repeated the doctor. Yes, and my poor grandmother fancies that her husband, whom she never left, is calling her and that she must go and join him. Oh, Monsieur de Avernay, I beseech you, do something for her. Where is she? In her room with the notary. And Monsieur Nautier, just as he was, perfectly clear in his mind, but still incapable of moving or speaking. And the same love for you, eh, my dear child? Yes said Valentine. He is very fond of me. Who does not love you? Valentine smiled sad sadly. What are your grandmother's symptoms? An extremely nervous excitement and an unnatural restlessness. This morning in her sleep, she fancied that her soul was hovering above her, over her body, which she saw asleep. It must have been delirium. She fancies too that she saw a phantom enter her chamber and even heard the noise it made in touching her glass. It is singular, said the doctor. I was not aware that Madame de saint Moran was subject to such hallucinations. It is the first time I ever saw her thus, said Valentine. And this morning she frightened me so that I thought she was mad and even my father, who you know is a strong-minded man, appeared deeply impressed. We will go and see, said the doctor. What you tell me seems very strange. The notary came downstairs and Valentine was informed her grandmother was alone. Go upstairs, she said to the doctor. And you? Oh, I dare not. She forbade me sending for you, and I am agitated, feverish, and well. I will go and take a turn in the garden to compose myself. The doctor pressed Valentine's hand, and while he visited her grandmother, she went into the garden. We need not say which was her favorite walk. After remaining for a short time in the flower garden surrounding the house and gathering a rose to place in her waist or hair, she turned into the dark avenue which led to the bench from thence to the gate. As she advanced, she fancied she heard a voice pronounce her name. She stopped, astonished. Then the voice reached her more distinctly, and she recognized it to be the voice of Maximilian. All right, guys, I'll see you next time.